Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, open up to 2 Samuel chapters 22 and 23. 22 and 23, that's on page 274 and 275 in the Pew Bible. If you don't have your own copy of God's Word, you can take that out of the pew there and use that to kind of follow along. I'm going to be reading chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, but we're going to be looking uh, at 22, 1 through 23. Seven. As you're opening up there, uh, I want to say a word about giving at First Baptist Church. And I've realized my heart's a blessing as a pastor. I, I don't like to talk about giving at First Baptist Church without f- starting what I'm saying with this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity unto the Lord, to the church. God has blessed us in countless ways here at First Baptist, and one of the things I love about this church is not only your willingness to be generous to your church, where you go to church, but also our church's willingness to be generous to others, to try to spread the blessings along. And so uh, this Easter season, we participated again, as we always do, in the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. All of those dollars go to the North American Mission Board of the SBC uh, toward church planning in North America. Our goal this year was $16,000. And uh, you've probably already seen it in the chimes, but I want to say thank you. Uh, We wound up bringing in $23,320.60. So we blew through uh, the goal, and that's a whole lot of money to get to give to that. And so thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Over $2,000 of that came through uh, Noodles for Nam, which is our little spaghetti night, uh, Wednesday night supper. And so I just want to say thank you all so much for your generosity unto the Lord um, it's a, it's a, a joy uh, for me to get to experience pastoring such a generous church. Thank you. Second Samuel chapters 22 and 23. I'm going to read v- chapter 23 verses 1 through 7. Just go ahead and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. The author writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read... God Himself is speaking to us, beginning in chapter 23, verse 1. Now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. For does not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help? And my desire. But worthless men are all like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his gospel. And God, we thank you for the opportunity we have today to gather together to worship you through the blood of your Son. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let me tell you something I've learned. I've been a dad now for a little over 12 years, and I have learned that if you ever mention something to your kids, they never forget it. And this is especially true if you make, ever make a promise. Now, there's exceptions to every rule, as you know. And so there are things you can mention to your kids that they will forget. They're guaranteed to forget it. So, for example, if I say, hey, can you take the trash out? That's forgotten after approximately 13 seconds. Just based on the research uh, that I've worked on, if you don't get them started on it within about a 13-second window, it's hopeless. Um, But I'll tell you this. They'll remember that I said we might get ice cream if this happened or that happened for 13 years. Uh, they'll, they'll never forget that. I mean, there, there'll still be times when I say it's important to tell the truth. And they'll say, well, you lied, Dad. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, you said we'd get ice cream, and we didn't, you know? And I'm like, well, okay. I guess I do. L- listen, kids don't forget anything. And I'll tell you this, it's a good start for the Christian life. 
it's a good start for the Christian life because there's almost nothing more important for our walk with the Lord than remembering God's promises. Remembering God's promises. As the book of 2 Samuel, and really the narrative of 1 and 2 Samuel, I think I've told you this enough times, hopefully you remember, but if you're new today, let me tell you this. 1 and 2 Samuel are really a singular story. They were originally written together. The only reason we have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel is because as the scriptures came to us, they were on two different scrolls. So it's just because scrolls weren't long enough to contain the whole book, but really they're meant to be tied together. In fact, you can see a lot of themes from Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 1 being picked back up in David's Psalms, 2 Samuel 22 and 23. But as 2 Samuel concludes, the, there's a pattern at the end of the book, and it's uh, the pattern of uh, a failure, one of David's failures. And the first failure, it was a failure to execute justice the way he should, and then things were made right. And then it's a detail of military history. And then there are two psalms, right, sandwiched in the middle. And in the way that the Bible structures this, it's meant that our focus is supposed to sort of come in on these psalms because then out from these two psalms, as 2 Samuel ends in chapters 23 and 24, you have another detail of military conquest and then finally another picture of David's failure, this time an outright sin of pride. But it's important in these two songs for us to notice that as we're focused in on the ending here, as the author here is trying to help us come to a satisfying conclusion at the end of this beautiful story of David's kingship and the beginning of God's promises to David and his line. He wants us to see the way that David is remembering God's promises. In particular, David is reflecting back, in particular in so many ways in these Psalms, on 2 Samuel chapter 7, which is the, the, the passage where we're introduced to what we would call the Davidic covenant, where God makes his covenant with David. David is reflecting back on God's faithfulness to him in the episode when Saul was trying to kill him, and then God's faithfulness to him in making promises to him and to his household, this covenant that God makes with him. With all that being said, though, it seems like a strange place to put these songs it seems like it would make more sense for these psalms to be right there. Maybe this should be Second Samuel chapter 8, right after God's covenant. But you'll remember almost immediately after Second Samuel chapter 7, we begin to get a picture of the fall of David, David's sin with Bathsheba and the subsequent consequences. So it's interesting here that you have this, uh, this song about God's faithfulness and this song about God's promises and this song about all that God did through David. It's interesting that you have it not after 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. But after the failure of David, instead, this song comes. After this great detail of his sins, after these rebellions. In fact, one of the rebellions was out of his own house. Out of this blessed house that God is building for him, rebellion came. So after this failure, after this rebellion, this is when we highlight these songs. I think, though, that the author is putting it here intentionally. Anytime something seems a little out of joint in the Bible... I want you to remember it's there for a purpose. It's there to try to help pique your attention. I think the author is wanting us to see how David's faith got him through such challenging days, but he also is trying to show us, as we'll see as we work through these passages, we're going to also show us how David's faith is looking out beyond his own life. David is testifying here, and the author of Samuel is testifying here about the way that as David is seeking the kingship and living out the kingship of Israel in his failures and in his triumphs, he's realizing that what God is doing through King David is bigger than the kingdom of Israel and it's bigger than the kingship of David. What God is doing through the house of David, in other words, is bigger than the house of David. And Absalom's rebellion and countless other examples help point us to that. David's faith then is looking out beyond his own life. And so as we look at these passages, these beautiful psalms that, that give us a portrait of David's faith, I think we're going to be able to see here this morning four truths about the life of faith. I want to show you this morning four truths 
that I believe will help you walk by faith in your own life. Here's the first point this morning. Here's the first point. Faith trusts God's power. Faith trusts God's power. And David, verse 1 of chapter 22, spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies, from the hand of Saul. By the way, this is very similar, almost identical to Psalm 18. So we have these verses in two places in the Bible, both times with the same sort of superscription introducing it. So you see, this is David's song after, not chronologically, this is after the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So intentionally, the author's telling us from the get-go, chronologically, this is further back. It's not right now. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1, you'll, you'll see the way that Hannah talks about the fact God is going to exalt the horn of His anointed one. And here at the end of 2 Samuel, we see God's plan made clear. What was shrouded there for Hannah is now clear for us as we see what God is doing through David. I call upon the Lord who is worthy Worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Some of you might be singing the song, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. Note the praise. David praising God for what he's done, expressing his trust in the Lord. But I want you to notice something about this psalm. This psalm, these early verses, verses 1 through 20, of 2 Samuel chapter 22 is almost entirely focused on God's power, on what God can do. Some of you right now may be struggling with wondering why God's not doing what you want Him to do. You ever been there before? I've been there before. And I'm a preacher, I ought to know better, right? I don't know if you know this, we don't tell God what to do, Right? Uh, God, God's in charge. We're, we're not the boss. And yet we might be wondering why God isn't doing what we wish he would do. Some of us might even be struggling to the point that we're wondering about God's power, God's power to work. Certainly David could have felt that way. God had promised him the kingship and yet his former mentor, his former boss Saul was after his life trying to kill him in all sorts of different contexts. Notice what we see about this psalm. In verse 7, when David was on the verge of death, God hears. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. In in verse 8, God responds. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because God was angry. God begins to work and act on David's behalf. God acts in wrath in verse 9. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. God bows the heavens and comes down. He rends open the heavens and comes to act on behalf of David in verses 10 and 11. In verse 14, God thunders. And as he thunders, he speaks. In verse 15, God sends out arrows of lightning. David gives his troubles an image. He he talks about his troubles like he's drowning. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a situation where you just had bit off a little more than you could chew swimming wise. When I was a little boy, we had gone to the pool to swim with a friend of mine. I wanted to kind of show out and I could swim, but maybe not as well as I needed to. And uh, the slide went into the deep end. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, we're going to go down the slide today. And she said, Matt, you're not, you don't need to go down the slide. I said, Mom, I'm ready. I'm going to go down the slide. And she said, well, we'll see. And I said, that's right. We'll see me going down that slide. <laughs> and we saw me going down that slide. But I'm going to tell you something. I got in there into that pool and... I guess it was the hubris and the pride and the arrogance of seven or eight year old me, five, six, seven year old me. But man, whatever training I had about swimming went out of my mind and I was just flailing there. 
And I just remember the pure panic. Finally, an older boy jumped in and helped me get out and everything else. And you talk about an embarrassing moment in front of your buddy that you've been talking all cocky in front of and everything else. But at that moment, I, I can remember just thinking, I need out of this water more than anything else. And David takes that imagery and applies it to his troubles here in this psalm. He, he talks about how the, the waters are around him, how he's ensnared in, in these waters. The waves of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. It's exactly the kind of thing I was saying on the edge of the pool that day. David says this, but notice what God does. Verse 8, he rebukes the seas. The channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of His breath of His nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. David says, in the midst of feeling like I'm drowning in these troubles, God came and acted. God took me out. God rescues, he tells us in verse 18, from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. God supports him, he says, in the day of his calamity he brought me out verse 20 into a broad place he rescued me because he delighted in me friends you may feel like you're drowning today you may feel upside down in your circumstances it may feel like a challenge you can never recover from but brothers and sisters the eye of faith sees the power of God and trusts him even in difficult days and if God was faithful to David he will be faithful to you if you are in his son Jesus Christ you can count on it you can be sure God is powerful and faith trusts his power but second of all Faith sees God's ways as best. Faith sees God's ways as the best ways. Faith sees God's ways as best. Now, verses 21 through 31 at first glance might be troubling for us. Especially after this long season of sort of having to live through David's season of sin and consequences be troubling and as you can tell one thing I love about the Bible it doesn't paint the heroes in a always positive light the Bible tells the truth and so it tells us some hard truths about David so it can be troubling to us when we read verses 21 and 22 the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands he rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now let's think about this for just a second. Does that sound like the David we've been reading about in 2 Samuel? No, it feels like at every turn he's departing from the ways of God. It feels like his wicked hands are trying to do all sorts of different things in these moments. Notice what verse 25 says. You, think you can't get any bolder. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness, my sight. How do we reconcile this with the 51st Psalm? Purge me, O God, make me clean. (laughs) Begging God to make him clean. Now listen, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this. Context always matters when we read the Bible. And if you read a psalm like this and start to think, well, maybe the Bible's less about grace and more about works, more about law-keeping than I thought, because it seems like David's rewards are coming from righteousness. So if I'm in these difficult circumstances, I wonder if it's because I'm not doing right. Remember what David's talking about here. He's talking specifically. Remember how he introduced the psalm? How the psalm was introduced? He's talking specifically about when he was delivered from the hand of Saul and all of his enemies. And do you remember what was happening in David's life then? I've already alluded to it this morning. He was being chased by Saul to be killed. He was being unjustly accused of things. He was being mistreated. And you might remember this. More than, on more than one occasion, David had the opportunity to take justice in his own hands. To take his life in his own hands and to kill King Saul. Now, anyone at face value would have seen that as a justifiable thing to do. But God sees things differently. We do things according to God's righteousness. So the temptation would have been to murder the king and be done with it. But David instead kept the ways of the Lord. With the merciful, verse 26 says, you show yourself merciful. 
With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. You save a humble people, humble people. For you are my lamp, O Lord. Verse 29. And my God lightens my darkness. Now notice verse 31. This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. We would be so wrong-minded to read these verses and think to ourselves, well, because David was righteous, God made him king. No, 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 no. No, no, God showed mercy and grace to David. He revealed his word to him. And what David is saying is he was kept on the throne because at the times he had to do things according to his own wisdom or according to the world's wisdom, instead he followed the light of God's law and God honored that righteousness. That's very different than a works-based salvation. God does honor His Word. God does want us to follow His Word. You see, friends, faith and obedience are not opposed to one another. Grace and obedience are not opposed to one another. In fact, faith and righteousness are joined at the hip. Everywhere faith goes, righteousness goes. And so there in these challenging days, when David was tempted to go his own way, instead by faith, he trusted the word of the Lord. He believed in God's promises. And in so doing, he lived out God's righteousness. And God honored that righteousness. This is not an attack against grace. This is upholding God's grace. This is upholding living by grace through faith. My friends, I want you to know this. Faith trusts that God's ways are best even when it may seem like our own way is best. By faith, would you trust God and remember that faith and righteousness always travel together. Third of all, the third point is this. Faith leads to action in the present. Faith leads to action in the present. Faith trusts God's power. Faith sees God's ways as best. And faith leads to action in the present. Friends, faith is not an excuse for spiritual laziness. You might have heard phrases like, let go and let God. Now, I understand what people mean when they say this sort of thing. We want to make sure we're not trying to grab the wheel. But every now and again, folks, I want you to know, most of the time, God wants you to act according to His Word. He wants you to do something. I want you to notice the alternating emphases here in verses 32 down into verse 49. Verses 32 through 37, David talks about what God did. This rock motif continues. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Notice what he says. He made my feet like the feet of the deer. And he set me secure on the heights. Verse 34. Verse 35. He trains my hands for war. Verse 36. You have given me the shield of your salvation. And your gentleness made me great. 32 through 37. Focus on what God did. But notice, based on what God is doing, David then takes action. Verses 38 and 39, I want you to see it. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. Verses 40 through 42, we're back to what God did. Do you see it? For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. They looked, verse 42, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. But then 43, we're back to what David did. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down the mire of the down like the mire of the streets. Verse 44, it's what God did. You delivered me. Verses 45 and 46. Foreigners came cringing to me as soon as they heard of me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses it's back to what David did and then as the psalm begins to conclude we see this crescendo of praise unto the Lord for what he has done the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God the rock of my salvation the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me who brought me out from my enemies you exalted me above those who rose against me. Do you see this? 
Who did it? <laughs> who destroyed the enemies of God? Who, who destroyed the enemies of David? Who, who is it that brought this great peace and conquest into Israel? Was it God or was it David? Oh, it was God working through David, wasn't it? Do you see how his trust in the Lord led to action? It led him to do something? It led him to accomplish something? Friends, I I want you to know something. Faith doesn't mean we sit back and just wait on God to do things. Faith means that we take action according to God's work. By faith, we take action based on God's work and our trust in God's power. That's what faith does. That's how faith leads us. There's one more thing in this passage that we see that faith does. And it's this. Faith sees God's purpose for the future. Faith sees God's purpose for the future. Verse 50. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring, forever here we are at the very center of this closing pattern the very core in fact you can see the way that this pattern continues because you have this picture of God's anointed in chapter 22 verse 51 and then again in 23 1 this word anointed is brought up again so this pattern is carrying itself out it's another way the Bible's cluing us in to read these two passages together One passage written before David's great sin, another written after. So we read these superscriptions. And here at this moment, it might feel strange to us. It might feel strange to us for maybe one of two reasons. One, it might seem strange to us because what a strange time to bring this up. David has sinned against the Lord. This God who has anointed him as king. This God who chose him to do this, God has sinned against him. His offspring, that are meant to be this blessing to him and the whole world, to Israel and others, have, has rebelled against him. Absalom, his son, who is king material, who seems like he should be the heir, has rebelled against his own father. And then here these poems are sandwiched between two episodes that paint David in a negative light. He had failed to properly carry out justice, and then next week we'll see the sin of pride in David's own life. Another reason you might find it strange is, man, if I was God, I think I'd just move on. I think I might find another plan, you know? You say, I I think I might find another family to work through. One, one, One that he can reward according to the righteousness. A less dysfunctional bunch, perhaps. But I want you to notice something here. You might not be able to tell this here. It's something we could easily lose. But Verse 51. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. That word anointed and that word offspring, both of those are singular words. Those aren't plural. Those are singular In other words, if David was just simply talking about his house and his line, he might be talking in a more plural sense here. But in both of these contexts here, he's using a singular word. He's referring to an anointed one. He's referring to an offspring. David talks about this in the, I mean, Paul talks about this later when he's referencing back to the promises to Abraham when God says seed, not seeds. Again, the same motif is coming up here. And then again, this anointed of God is brought up again. And as we go on into 23, into David's last words, he talks about the eternal promises of God and the way that God's promises stand forever. And here we can see the way that in the midst of this sinfulness, the author is sandwiching these references to God's promises in the midst of sin one of these is called David's last 
words, and yet they're talking about the future. Paul talks like this later when he says, I testify to you that David is dead and buried, and yet the promises of God stand forever. How is that so? Who is this anointed one? Who is this offspring? Brothers and sisters, I testify to you today that David by faith, that the author of Samuel by faith, is looking not only at the temporary kingdom that's there, but he's looking at the eternal kingdom that will be established through the offspring of David, our Lord Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Do you see this? Do you see the way that David is looking out into the future as the Spirit comes on him and he speaks this oracle of God and he's seeing that there is a Messiah who will come, who will not falter, who will not fail, who will not rebel, who will not be unfaithful. A Messiah is coming who will keep God's commands, who will walk perfectly before the Lord. There is a rock on whom we will build our faith. There is a rock on whom God will build His kingdom and it is it's very much so the case that he is the rock of ages who was cleft for us. He took the punishment that we deserved for our sins in order that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Friends, do you see the beauty of God's promises? Does it inspire you to trust the Lord? To put your faith in Him? Will you trust His power? Will you trust His righteous law? Will you trust Him enough to take action according to His word? Oh, most of all, friends, do you trust His purpose for the future? His purpose to bring all things together through His Son, Jesus Christ. His promise to save anyone who will turn in repentance and faith to Him through Jesus. Friends, I hope your faith is in God. And I hope you'll remember, I hope you'll remember His promises. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never trusted Jesus for the first time, Today, I would love to give you the opportunity. It's here. If you'll turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you will be saved. At least what the Scripture teaches. And friends, God keeps His promises. He who promised is faithful. So this morning, if you need someone to talk to, if you need someone to pray with you, if you want to do business with the Lord right where you are, if you want to come down and just pray at the altar, but I want you to know if you need someone to talk to, I'll be waiting on you after this prayer. In just a moment, as the song plays, I'd love to talk to you. But you will be saved if you'll turn from your sins and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus. Second of all, you may be a believer and you may say, Pastor, I just need to draw near to the Lord. This time is for you to do business with God right where you are, down front. If you need someone to talk to, you know where to find me, right down front. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. What a joy it would be for me today to talk to you about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.